Kelvin Sol, thank you so much for coming through to Durban. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Let's give you a round of The gullet of an open null, misting in and out, in and out of sight as its breath freezes through locked cauliflower heads, the rigor mortis of hake, stiff and lugubrious, and vata blomachies lined up like seasick rusters, unpacked for easy access, swallows whole my thinking. I trail my fingers, those fragile bones of memory that once shook hands, embraced, waved to, a serene woman I almost loved, bayoneted in a cross-border raid. Two close friends, both soon to be gunned down on the steps outside their homes. Three confidants, all turned police informer. I trail my fingers over the guarantees and barcodes, mutter to myself that all is now well, except inflating prices. At the till, a life-size doll of our country's president, dressed up as Father Christmas, can't seem to stop itself from beaming. I know I continue fretting over nothing, should no longer worry what I say these days into the inviting mouth of any telephone. What everything costs is now clear, and it's hard to feel despondency or grief inside a supermarket. The second um, poem is from the same period of time. Uh, it's called Housing Targets. Somewhere in our past we believed in the future, that a better world would discover foundation under our feet and we would be forever singing in its kitchen. Bricks pile up in a field. Whether they will be enough, no one knows. How they fit together is anybody's guess. Men with darkening skins scribbled on by weather wait for their instructions. From time to time, limousines miraculously appear. There is always a somebody in a suit willing to smile and shake their hands who lays the first stone. Then the camera lights and racing engines turn around, shrink back from where they came. Those left behind stare at their own hands afterwards puzzled at precisely what has been transacted, why they are still being offered bonds. Squint between gnarled fingers, pace out the hopeful distances. There will be a flower bowl. My bed is going here. As for now, the doorknobs have no doors. Their windows peer out at no sky. I'm now um, turning for a little bit to my most recent book. Uh, this is Walking Falling, which was published earlier this year, which I will be launching on Saturday if anybody is interested. And one of the um, constant pieces of interest in my work, the themes that runs through my work, is the issue of the depiction of land and landscape, which is always an important phenomenon, but in South Africa particularly so. Um, the Argentinian novelist Julio Cortazar once said, everything looked so natural as always when you don't know the truth. So I want to start uh, with a poem about a place very close to where I live, which tends to be depicted very romantically in both black and white poetry in South Africa. And it's one of those places, if you look more carefully, it's not quite what it seems. And this poem is about that. It's called Seafront. The future wants to show its blurred ideal face, though all the maps where it can materialize are full of holes. Here be monsters. Close by, the tides fetch lessons, though waves pleat up and flip the sun's image into a twinkling coinage. All our boats are out to sea. Excuse me, Captain? Captain? He makes a beeline towards my pity while his friend upends their shared pupsuck for a final drop. Young enough to be his daughter, 
The teenager who walks after me, crooning a song, holds out a dusty flail of proteas. She can still smile, yet may not have the best intentions, eyes occluded into tuk. Three gym rattled women break off their conversation to peer out at our slow passage above the rims of cappuccinos. Their mouths open like fish in unison, then close again. Here there's not much for diversion. Shop windows no longer reflect who we may want to be, are just dark caves of clutter. Frayed postcards, scrimshaw, T-shirts to proudly proclaim a wearer, native. On the beach, the hulk they burned the dealers out of rots on the sand. It's too far for any surge to reach and bottlenecks wait in ambush for bare feet. A world where opposites blur and coalesce. On one side of the road, a Cuban restaurant and flag. On the other, streamers that proclaim the sang Freud of estate agents. Even the afternoons beclouded. Bladderack and kids in wetsuits bob in a surf, clawing to stay near shore with chilled white fingers. To be honest, nothing really shifts or changes. Loud hunger tears forever at the throats of gulls. Tourists renew their pilgrimages in summer while routinely the world falls from us. Who we are is bitten from teeth chipped and yellowed that have nibbled around too many spoons. Each year, it's harder to move past incrustations of habit. But after all, I say to the Congolese professor now reduced to touting parking spots for chips, it should be clear to us that when Fanon says, then I find that he's no longer listening. This is a very different poem. Um, I might have mentioned last night that I live at, towards the bottom of a mountain. Um, and this is about my house. Uh, and it's about... Uh, paranoia too, it's a certain kind of paranoia. I tried to look it up in Google and I couldn't find a word for fear of falling rocks or particularly fear of stones that move on their own volition. Um, it's got just about everything. There's actually, you know there's a phobia about thinking a duck is watching you? <laughs> it's called anitidophobia, in case you didn't know. But nothing about this. So anyway, it will again, it will explain itself. It's called My Garden at Night. And it's, it, it, it's a kind of poem where I'm puzzled every morning when I go out onto what I have of lawn, that the little stones seem to move across the lawn by their own, on their own volition. And I'm really not making this up, but they do. And I've never kind of worked out why this happens. My garden at night shrugs and changes its dimensions. I go to bed to the sight of luxuriating grass dappled by shadow, but in the morning, stones, stones, stones that deliver themselves like letters from the mountain, each bearing underneath a unique version of a scorpion's seal, and come in darkness more persistent than the sea, the waves that brag vainly in the distance. <coughs> Blushing in oranges and reds from oxide and from lichen, the smaller ones that seem to creep overnight across the lawn waylaying good sense, will one day be enough to bury all four walls in which I cower. Even worse, to learn that larger rocks can sing. Yes, in an eerie, painstaking monotone so low, only the forsaken or mad have fortitude enough to hear them. Yet their droning is the only thing that prevents our planet cleaving, stops its halves flying outwards into space, Half apples split from their core, and we're kept sane by this alone. Otherwise, we'd twin into opposing mirrors, fake faces that goggle at each other, each proclaiming love for what, in truth, is just a copy of itself. Sometimes, pushed by one Norwest squall too many, or a puff adder's bad breath, or by the negligent forefoot of a spider, a chunk of the sandstone is coerced into letting go, only for a second, its grip. It is enough. Oh, relax its grip. Oh, oh, to tumble down to where I stand. Please know where I live. And a car is crushed. 
or a flock of guinea fowl, or Auntie Mabel's laundry room plus the pastor's swimming pool, obliterating his niece and nephew and curtailing her spin cycle. So dawn's no abstract beauty here. Rocks stand still at last. Breezes shift within their journeys. Guinea fowl eggs begin to stir and everyone starts to breathe more normally again, as if it all were over. But no. The opposite of avuncular, half-arsed, biting my lip at the foot of an unplicated mountain, where rocks can dirge then lose their grip to plummet into smithereens, among the washing machine sunscreen pristine plunge pools down below, here where I am. I must have faith that my own disasters will be small and incremental. That's why I drink my coffee in the backyard every morning, apparently at ease, but hypnotized. Gazing up the slope as if enraptured by its tears of aloes, bushes, flowers, though with one eye truly on the stones. I'm now going to read a, a succession of love poems. Um, I'll, I'll start with a poem called Your, um, Your Body Fills My Night. Your body fills my night. Starless, but your body fills my night. You with two scars on your stomach, two stabs, two wounds. When you undress, they show themselves as screams relived, commas where your life once faltered. Two memories of a knife, the size and shape of blinding pennies. In darkness black as this, they turn to pits beneath my nails. I don't know all your story, but no words can encompass these. All I know is that when your belly bears its witness, your nakedness lights up my night, for your body has its own two stars. This is the only poem I'm going to read. I have a book of praise poems. Uh, oh, praise poems. Prose poems, not easy bongo. <laughs> um, and this is, it's, it's called pro, prose poems, but it's a kind of mixture of genres. Some is more like flash fiction. In fact, a lot of the stuff that's been anthologized from this has ended up in flash fiction anthologies rather than anything else. And I suppose this is closer to not, not quite so flash fiction. It's called, He Had to Come In. There were too many mosquitoes by now around the outside lamp, so he had to come in. Besides, despite the moon, evening mist had covered up the dance of tiny mirrors on the flay. The stars were all rubbed out, and he had no excuse left. He had sat still on the balcony for so long through the chill biting to his bones, though that a marsh owl had perched on a stump a stone's throw away and scrutinized him fixedly for quite a while. For some reason, this had made him uncomfortable. What are you doing, she said to him as he closed the door. She was pretending to fuss over supper. Nothing, he said. He glanced at her, tried to avoid scratching the open sores near his wrist until she stopped watching. She seemed really calm tonight. You look a little less pale. Are you feeling okay? Well, at least I'm not losing weight anymore, he said. Are you sure? You know the doctor said your cell count wasn't as it should be. She picked up some knives and forks, dropped one. And you still look so thin to me. Don't you think you should eat something? Don't you think, actually, I feel goddamn awful. Are you happy that I've said it? As soon as the words came out, he regretted them. She had decided not to leave him, after all. I don't really know why you think you can still talk that way to me, she said. She turned back to the counter and pretended to wipe it. He could see that she was start going to start crying again and sighed. But she didn't. Instead, she turned fully to confront him, looked straight at him. It's not my love that's killing you, she said.
I want what comes after. The first lifted bucket's clang once the roosters all crowed out. A keen thirst for fresh water is sequel to that sound. Your smell drying on my skin, your fingers brushing briefly against my stomach as you stir awake from dozing. Or, when you're gone, an empty shape left sprawled asleep within the blankets on my bed. I want what comes after, the miraculous vigil of a moth unburnt beside us on the sheets, toast starting to brown, the nails of a scabby cat across the floor, conclaves of birds upon the eaves, the rustle of trees as they begin to post their letters to the wind, wind that's strong enough to blow off a roof of morning mist, a sky like a field that begs a plough emerging, and the two of us looking outside to find the dawn to which we'll trust our bodies. Consider this. Here everyone lives in genuflection to themselves, to their masters, or to those who cover their own carapace with words to convince all the rest of us of their woundedness. Hysterics on Twitter behead the sentence, recycling cliches and abuse. No one here admits we are all ramshackle. No one admits we are so in love with the mausoleum of grievance and power that we wound ourselves. And to help us, the shining ones are always with us, who discover the brightness of a conviction, then roll their words towards us, backwards like little dung beetles. So if we ceased to be bedazzled, we'd see only ass. Enzitzberger ends a poem this way. Because it is someone else, always someone else, who does the talking, and because he who is being talked about keeps his silence. This is called body language, and it's in two parts. The first part sets the scene, and the other part reflects in it, on it. Body language. You sifted the earth from my body, hung words on the door frames of my eyes, the elbows of my sight dislocated. One singed sleeve fluttering in the breeze you thought was a flag of hope. Grain by grain you owned my earth. My wife, skulls in her womb she had not foreseen giving birth, were there. Arms akimbo she stands in an alley between two shacks, watching, smelling, firemen and scorched human meat a stench of loud voices consoling her, her braille of blisters touched by the fingertips of her neighbors. My children, wind, see sieved through zinc. What are you doing with my words? You say you do, but you don't speak for me. Harsh words that think they're gentle tears, dissolving away this pebble of my reality, my tiny reality. My will a stone heavy in my gut, knocking beneath my ribs, a life that never struggles out. My children dead in their mother's arms. My family a map of blood still has to hear your words, your huge words. I can sense them, black or white, in black and white. Their upstrokes suave but incomplete as a Judas kiss tongues without fulfillment, each one preparing for the downstroke of its false regard to complete my sentencing. Thanks very much.